from New York City for our viewers worldwide. I'm Shanali Basak and Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Top Fed officials say that they'll wait for rate cuts. Short-term rates move higher, heading closer to 5%, and hawkish Fed minutes cast doubt over restrictive territory. But we begin with the big issue. The data backs up higher for longer. We have so many Fed speakers talking about higher for longer. Higher for longer. Higher for longer. We're going to see higher for longer. The Fed is on hold for the foreseeable future. The Fed's in a tough spot. The reality is that the Fed is highly data dependent. The minutes which came before the latest economic data. Those came across a little more hawkish than expected. Policymakers are actually debating whether policy is restrictive or not. The inflation data are starting to look a lot better. Jobless claims are still extremely low. The luxury of not being in a rush and, and not having urgency, that will really change if we start to see more weakness in the labor market. If you started to see softness in the labor market, they, they would have every indication to cut. As long as consumers are continuing to work, I think the Fed can continue to focus on inflation. The Fed is putting pressure on the economy. What the Fed is doing will eventually work. The Fed probably will see that slowing in inflation that it wants to see. It does come back, doesn't it, about do the Fed need to act and are they better to start acting before they have to start acting? Now I want to take a look at short-term rates because the two-year yield for the year looks like it's approaching that 5% level once again. If you take a look of just how far we've come this year, it's been a significant ride higher, though we had some breath of relief here in the middle of May where you saw the bid in the bond market come in more significantly with those hopes of rate cuts and more recently a lot of caution from Fed officials about the direction of inflation and when the data will say they're ready to cut. Now I want to flip up the board here because you have an interesting dynamic when you look at financial conditions because you would not be able to see that reversal in yields in the way that you look at the way financial conditions have stayed nice and loose. You have seen it the loosest really since the middle of 2021 and there are questions about why this is when rates are expected to stay higher for longer, when this starts to really start to tighten materially and if this is even getting in the way of the Fed's job. Now earlier this week Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic spoke with our own Michael McKee about the state of rates. I do think that our new steady state is likely to be higher than what people have known over the last decade, maybe back to where we were in the 1990s and 2000s, uh, but we'll just have to see. And joining us now is Morgan Stanley's Vishy Tirupattar and Invesco's Noel Coram. Vishy, you know, you were the one earlier this year, late last year, that really started to pitch the idea of going out on the curve a little more. And if you were an investor, both in the short term and the long term at this point, you felt that whiplash. So what is the recommendation today? I think our recommendation is that over the course of the rest of this year, we will see the upside surprises we've gotten in inflation data begin to reverse. And we, would, we think that we, inflation will be steadily decrease over the rest of the year. And there are multiple reasons for that. We think shelter will, 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 will start seeing shelter inflation coming down. There's a, a, a good case to be made that between now and end of the year, um, we'll see this deceleration happen. And along with this deceleration, we think that the, the market will, the Fed uh, will, uh, it will be data driven and the market will begin to interpret um, more Fed cuts coming, not you know on hold forever. We continue to think there'll be three cuts coming this year. So starting in September. So, so we have three cuts penciled in for this year. Uh, we need certainly the market and the Fed needs more data. But we do expect the data will show deceleration, notable deceleration in the pace of inflation. That will be the signal for the Fed to begin to move towards um, uh, normalizing policy. Noel, what's the move here for you with a two year getting closer to 5%? Where is the buying opportunity? Yeah, it's, this will be fun because we actually have a little bit different view than Vichay. So our base case is for growth to be a little bit higher than consensus, and that's largely underpinned by the consumer. Of course, there's risks there that we have to watch. 
Inflation will be boring, so we do expect it conti to continue to come down and the Fed to grow confident. And then policy, we think, is largely priced in. So the Fed's going to go one or two times. So that's largely priced. So where does that leave us? That leaves us growth as the main driver. We could see continued volatility in rates, especially throughout the summer. We're likely to see the, the curve steepen a little bit and uh, long end move up higher. I'm glad you talked about that curve steepener because that's also been a very, very popular trade. Vishy, when you start getting significant returns from that steepening play? I think we will, over the course of next, say, we, in, my, in fact, uh, I, we don't think that would be that different from Noel. You know, it's the two, uh, two cuts or three cuts. Our view is three cuts, but I think it's a good case for that. But, um, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if it ends up being two cuts. Um, I, I do think that the we will see over the course of the next six to 12 months, we will see the, the steepener actually beginning to work. So we, we think that the better way of, there are the better ways of expressing that, uh, that underlying duration long through, you know, than just the outright steepeners. It's a very crowded rate. But I do think that if we look at look ahead, um, you know, in uh, you know, in second quarter of 2025, our expectation is two year would be at 360, and uh, the 10 year uh, would be at 375. So we would begin to you know inversion that we see now. We expect it to go away over the course of the next 12 months. I'm going to force both of you actually here to make the case because even at two cuts, you're above really market consensus at this point in time. The market is really pricing in at least one cut, barely really, and there's a lot of divergence on where that cut will come from and if it will come at all. Noel, what's the biggest risk to the view? For our view personally, we have to watch inflation, and that is, you know, probably our next big, biggest risk in terms of probability-wise. Because if inflation is stickier than we expected, then we start to see cuts priced out, and then that increases the likelihood of cracks in the economy. So that's something that we have to be concerned about, especially as you know, risk asset managers. And Vishy, why do you believe three is possible? What gives you conviction to think that we can even get that far when one is still barely on the table for many people in this market? But, you know, if you look from the beginning of the year to now, there's been quite a bit, bit market pricing for the number of acres has dramatically changed. It's changed from seven to one to now about two. And uh, all of this has been driven by how inflation data is worked. And inflation data in the first quarter of the year clearly surprised the upside. And the biggest driver, we think, is has been shelter is a major driver of that. And we think that the there's good um, forward-looking indic indicators in terms of how uh, new rent growth is evolving, that there is a clear uh, six, roughly six-month time lag between when the rent growth has dropped and uh, that begins to show up in inflation data. And we expect that that will begin to show up between the, over the next two quarters. So... The, the, we are, our conviction is really driven by how we expect inflation to pan out. So could we be wrong? Of course we could be wrong. But I, uh, our, uh, our models are reflecting that all the forward-looking indicators would show a, a decelerating inflation. And that, we think, will be what drive Fed. And we think maybe a, perhaps one slight difference of opinion between Noel and, and, and us would be that we think inflation is a more driving um, for driving factor behind Fed's policy than growth. I think at this point, Fed cares so much more about how inflation is evolving than how growth is evolving. Noel, I want to ask you a question that we asked Vishy a little earlier in the program, this idea of duration. Do you feel comfortable going out on the curve at this point in time for opportunities? So, no, in, in short, and I would look, just because we expect, again, of course, we think that inflation is going to be a big driver for this year, and that data is, uh, you know, something that we're watching. But then, at least for the summer ones, we think a lot of the, you know, the dependence on data, the surprises in growth will kind of pressure yields higher. And then if we see growth more, rates, excuse me, more around uh, near 5% on the 10-year, that's when I would look to go long. Now, Vishy, what do you think is the most underloved trade? We were kind of talking about uh, uh, crowded trades a second ago. Where do you think that there's opportunity moving forward? I think I think Noel reflects the the, the underloved trade. I mean, people going long duration is certainly and it's a negative carry trade, and you um, that's uh, clearly people are um, not willing to go long duration. That's that's definitely underloved. My my our view really is that maybe the best way to play this is actually through. Um, positive carry trades within fixed income. So going beyond, stepping beyond rates, 
a number of spread products have positive carry. So our counter to that is that the, there are better ways of playing this than being um, just being you know, you know, uh, in the rates market. Uh, I think the best opportunity is in the spread product, in, in credit, in securitized products, in emerging markets, et cetera. There are much better opportunities that are underlying driven by this, but have the benefit of being positive carry. Noel, how do you feel about this? Because on one hand, you have seen just tremendous investor interest in different types of credit products, but you also have to wonder, the higher we stay at this level, when does that start to bite? Right, so we think about you know, kind of fundamental risk or risk assets in kind of three buckets. We have your fundamental portion, your valuations, and your technicals. And at least in the near term, term Fundamentals, more of a longer term view as well, but fundamentals are, are strong, uh, right? We saw a strong earnings season. And then um, on the, the technical side, supply is expected to fall this summer. So that should provide a strong technical bid, at least to clip the coupon for the summer. And then lastly, on valuations, this is obviously the most concerning part, right? You have the high yield market, for example, that has 60% of issues with spread below 200 basis points. So that's where kind of the, the bread and butter of the, the way that we invest comes in. We really stress diversification here. Don't get, don't have all your eggs in one basket, uh, in one basket as well as the, the having a tilt to higher quality, shorter duration bonds. You definitely, don't, this is not going to be the year where you really hit the home runs with a, a name because valuations are so tight. We have to leave it there. Vichy Turukatur of Morgan Stanley, Noel Korm of Invesco, we thank you so very much. Very complicated market to navigate right now. Now, up next is the auction block. Companies like UPS, Comcast, and Staples rush to price new debt ahead of the Memorial Day holiday. Stick with us for that. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. Ali Basic, and this is Bloomberg Real Yield. And it's time now for the auction block where global debt sales remain on a very strong pace. Alibaba sold 4.5 billion worth of convertible bonds, a record for a dollar denominated sale by an Asian company. The deal aims to secure capital needed to buy back shares and invest in businesses. And moving to US high grade, Comcast and UPS highlighted a week that saw over 26 billion in sales. And it was a front loaded week with no deals the last two days. And now about 115 billion have been sold this month. And in high yield, the week's volume coming in over $11 billion, the third highest level for the year. One notable name was Staples, which had more than $2.5 billion of a sale to go along with the $1.6 billion leverage loan. And earlier this week, we spoke to Sachin Kanjuria, Achilles Management's CIO, who says he sees some issues ahead for credit. Small cracks are starting to show. If you look at the pickup in default rates on the public side, high yield leverage loans, I think they're likely to be higher on the private side. Remember that a lot of companies with risky credit ratings have kind of migrated from uh, the public markets into the private markets. And so I think those cracks are starting to show. You're seeing emerging dispersion. Uh, it's not quick. It's not going to break tomorrow. But I think if you're paying attention, it's hiding in plain sight. It's important to put a spotlight on this now ahead of when we could see more general problems, especially if we are in a, you know, elevated rate environment, which appears to be, I think, more likely the case going forward. Joining us now is Kelly Burton, High Yield Portfolio Manager at Bearings, and Zach Griffiths, the head of U.S. Investment Grade and Macro Strategy at Credit Sites. And Kelly, you heard from Sachin Kajuria there of Achilles, small, small cracks starting to form in the market. Where exactly are those cracks in your view? Yeah, specifically in the world of high yield bonds, we see those in the cable, media, telecom, satellite space. So TMT overall uh, has been really um, a lot of landmines to navigate. We've had multiple large capital structures that are in the process of some liability management exercises. So those were tricky to navigate. If high yield overall is at 8%, a lot of those names are averaging more like 10, 11, 12%. Um, so you're seeing that's the, the segment of the market that's really 
quite wide. I thought some of those comments were interesting around leveraged loans in particular, um, because when you really look at that whole market, uh, on average, about 80% or so of all names in, in the loan world are actually trading over 98 cents on the dollar. So yes, there are some cracks, but they're quite modest overall. When you look at high yield, the distress ratio is just around 5% or so. So those capital structures have already priced in that risk. We feel like that's really where the future forward-looking defaults or out-of-court restructurings are going to come from. Um, so at those levels, it does still feel pretty manageable overall. Well, Zach, and I'll ask both of you this question. This idea of people not too worried about downgrades here or deterioration in credit, money flowing in ultimately to both of these indexes, high yield and investment grade. Where does that leave you on valuation for getting really the dollar for every dollar you put in? It's a great question, Shanali. And right now we see we have market weight allocations to both investment grade and high yield. We downgraded that with our 2Q outlook, really thinking that while spreads have tightened in quite a bit, we are looking for them to drift a bit wider. And so when you think about the elevated carry that you get from high yields, even though you have tight spreads, that looks pretty attractive. But from our perspective, it doesn't merit an overweight allocation. We're not looking for further spread compression from here. But even though you are perhaps seeing some small cracks, we aren't seeing signs that we're going to have a huge spread widening in the market this year. And so we're looking for high yield to finish the year around 350 and IG at 100 basis points. Well, Kelly, where does that leave you on valuation as well? Because if you're sitting here looking at both investment grade and high yield, do you have investors who are sitting around trying to look for that extra dollar, trying to search for that extra yield, going into riskier debt instead? Yeah, you've definitely continued to see inflows into the market. Um, yield buyers are continuing to step in. And when you look at high yield in particular, we remain pretty short duration overall. I think we're around three and a half years here in the U.S., lower threes, including Europe. Um, that's much shorter than investment grade. So that works pretty well in a higher for longer rate environment and more concerns around timing of future Fed rate cuts. Um, and so, yes, spreads are on... Um, uh, you know, at the outset look pretty tight relative to his for historical standards, but the yields, the duration are continuing to bring people in. And we spent a lot of time with investors discussing break-even return. So in order for the next 12 months to give you 0% in high yield, spreads would have to gap out um, more than 200 basis points. And it's hard for us to see the market getting there absent some larger event that's, that's unforeseen because we're not sitting in a recessionary environment at all. Um, spreads, once they've gapped out to five to 600 basis points, have really been a, a trigger for buyers to come in in a large way in the asset class. Well, where is the risk? You both seem generally sanguine, but if you think about what you said, Kelly, about duration, is part of that duration play in case things do get worse in the future? I think it's really, in our market, just very idiosyncratic at this point in time. So it's being really cognizant of the companies that are over levered. And so as they're having to come to the market to shore up maturities and refinance, right now the market has certainly been wide open, but the market's also sniffed out the more troubled credits or concerns about longer term risk to the valuations of those companies. We've here uh, recently had a couple larger transactions that have been difficult to get across the finish line. And so they've had to give concessions in a bigger way on pricing or documentation changes. So there's a bit of a pish pull because the very easy credits, it's wide open and, and simple to get refis done. Otherwise, there's been a little bit more work to get those trickier situations uh, across. So it's much more of a credit by credit picking than a broad statement on the market overall. There's also a question here about as rates stay higher for longer, how much of that will start to bleed into other parts of the credit world. This idea that there are more maturities slowly coming to the surface. Zach Kelly had given us some examples here on places that there were some stresses starting to show up. As this rate environment stays elevated, where else could you see some stresses? Yeah, I think the big concern certainly is down the rating spectrum. And when you look at elevated leverage within those names in the triple C world, that becomes a little bit more concerning. What's been interesting to us to see the market really open up so far this year to the majority 
of triple C rated credits, or you're actually starting to see more issuance there. Kelly highlighted some deals that we've been keeping an eye on, showing some difficulty getting through the market. But when we think about the balance of risks, just how much issuance we've already had priced this year and how much cash is still on the sidelines, it comes down to this idea that I think technicals still look very strong. And you mentioned this earlier, Shanali, that we're still seeing inflows into the asset classes, both IG and high yield, whether that be through mutual fund flows or ETF flows. And when we think about how much cash is still left on the sidelines, in our base case, we have a sanguine economic outlook. And I think the focus is going to remain on elevated yield. And we take a little bit of a different approach. We are more comfortable extending duration. And we really like being in that seven to 10 year bucket in the IG space as the spread curve is steep through there. And we do think the market is underpricing the probability of more rate cuts than are currently priced in the second half of 2024. Guys, we have to leave it there. That is Kelly Burton of Bearings and Zach Griffiths of Accredit Sites. Have a great long weekend to both of you. Now, still ahead, the final spread, the week ahead, the Fed's preferred inflation gauge in focus. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. And this is Bloomberg Real Yield. And it's time now for the final spread. The week ahead coming up, markets are closed in the United States on Monday for Memorial Day holiday. And UK markets also closed for spring bank holidays. And of course, tons of Fed speak next week. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester and Minneapolis Fed Neil Kashkari speaking on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, the Beige Book. We also have jobless claims on Thursday and that PCE number on Friday, as well as Eurozone CPI. But let's talk about the PC because it is indeed the Fed's preferred gauge of inflation because we want to show you the expectations before we let you go. The expectations from the prior are essentially flat, and it shows you just how hard this last mile has been to get the Fed on the course to its preferred set of inflation measures here. Of course, there is still growth expected and still a while to go to that 2% exactly, but we're getting a little closer. From New York that does it from us same time same place next week this was Bloomberg Real Yield and this is Bloomberg